Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm yeah. really pleased to be here. I'm really pleased to be talking about such an interesting and important topic. Um, Likewise. I mean, let's just get straight into it. We've had a great introduction. What is carbon transformation? What 12 works on? Yeah, we fundamentally define carbon transformation as taking waste carbon dioxide and using it as a feedstock to make materials and fuels that we use and love and you know, are, exist in this room. Everything from the chairs we sit on to parts of the stage to building materials to fuels. And we basically asked the question, like, what if we could take carbon dioxide and instead of having it being a symbol of contraction and reducing our, our economy, what if we saw it as a way to expand our economy? to create more jobs, to do something with the waste, to create new materials. And so that's at a very high level, like what we see is with carbon transformation. And we're, we're literally changing the oxidation state of the CO2 molecule as opposed to just using it directly as CO2. Okay. I think I saw on your website, you described this as like a form of alternative kind of like photosynthesis. So how does, mm -hmm. how does the process actually work? Yeah. So we're basically mimicking trees. So trees and plants take carbon dioxide from the air, they take water from the ground, and they use sunlight to convert that CO2 and water into sugars for their own growth and development. And they also release oxygen in the process. We do the exact same thing. So we take CO2 from a waste stream, usually like an industrial point source emission. We take water, and we use renewable electricity, our carbon-free electrical source, and we take the CO2 and water in the presence of a metal catalyst, we break down the CO2 and water into smaller atomic bits, and then reform those atomic bits into a new molecule. We also release oxygen as well. So from a chemical standpoint, it is chemically similar to what trees and plants do. And so in, in the way that trees provide this natural carbon cycle, we're looking at creating an industrial carbon cycle or industrial photosynthesis so that we can take some of the CO2 that we've been putting in the air from all these industrial processes over the past centuries, and we can use it to continue to grow our economy, to continue to make the fuels and materials that we use. And what's the kind of getting inside the kind of, the, you know, the hub of actually what's doing this? Like, what is the, the kind of proprietary tech or the unique sort of piece of technology or innovation that 12 has come up with that allows this to happen? Yeah. It, We've created our core technology, so it's an electrode. It looks like a uh, black square on a translucent membrane. And when we first started off, we had an uh, electrode that was the size of a post-it stamp. And that was our first prototype. We could you know, use that post-it stamp size electrode to show that we could make CO2 into something new. And then we've over four iterations have grown that electrode to something the size of a desktop monitor. And that desktop monitor size electrode is what we then stack into a hundred of those, it makes one stack. And then that stack goes into something that looks like a, or is about the size of a shipping container and has all the piping and pumping and so forth to support that stack. So bringing the CO2 in and the water in and electricity and then taking the products out and venting the oxygen. So that whole system, we had to build and design uh, internally with our team. So we built that in California, in Alameda, and we're now deploying that system out in uh, our first, what we call air plant, which is in Washington state. So there we'll have the CO2 coming in, uh, we'll have water that's there, we'll be converting that into jet fuel and then sending that jet fuel out to our partners we announced a partnership with Alaska Airlines and Microsoft. We also have a larger partnership with IAG, which is the parent company of several European airlines, including Iberia, uh, British Airways as well. So we're really excited about being able to deliver uh, regular fuel to these partners. We also have a blend called NAPSA. That NAPSA blend is used to make a lot of the consumer products so, um, you know, in the past, we've made lenses and sunglasses with Pangaea. We made a component in Tide Detergent with Procter & Gamble. Um, and we made a car part with Mercedes-Benz. And so we'll continue to build out those consumer lines with this uh, naphtha hydrocarbon blend that we make. 
Fascinating. How, how did you get into this? Like, if we go back to the beginning, like where, where did the desire to be in this sector come from? Yeah, so I did my graduate work at Stanford University, and me and my, one of my co-founders, uh, Dr. Kendra Cool, we were working together in the lab, and we were looking at, at research from a professor in Japan named Yoshio Hori. He was looking at um, this beaker, basically, of club soda, so it was CO2 dissolved in water, and he put two metal electrodes in that water and ran uh, electrical energy across those two electrodes. And he saw bubbles form. Those bubbles he measured, and he saw that there was methane and ethylene in them. And so he published papers and did all this work. And so we were reading about this, and we were fascinated. We were like, can we take this to the next level? Can we identify new molecules that we could make? Could we you know, um, engineer the, the, these metal electrodes such that they can make different products and different molecules? That would be interesting. So fast forward to now 2010, we're in the lab, and we did just that. We engineered a copper electrode, we applied a potential electrical energy, and we identified 16 new molecules that we could make with this process. We published on that, and we realized that each one of these molecules represented a multi-billion dollar industry. And so, we just asked the question, like, can we scale this up? Can we, is, you know, is this technology ready for industry? Is it ready to, um, is the economics there? And to really understand that, we had to build our first prototype. So we got into a program called Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. They have a program called Activate. It's specifically for deep tech founders. And it was great. It gave us resources. We had a st stipend for our own um, personal support, because we were all broke graduate students. And we went there and we started working on our first prototype. Again, that posted size electrode was, was the first thing we needed to make. And one thing we realized was that carbon dioxide is a very stubborn molecule. Um, our first hundred or so experiments that we did, you know, barely moved the needle in terms of converting carbon dioxide into anything. And I remember it was right around Christmas time, the lab was going to shut down, because we were at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and so they were going to shut down for two weeks. But you could petition to run an experiment over that time. So we have this meeting of like, okay, are we going to run this? Are we going to do one like kind of Hail Mary experiment to see if it could work? Or are we going to go home and wait till next year? And so, you know, there was like team go home, team <laughs> Christmas. And so, you know, I was part of team Christmas, and we said, okay, yeah, let's, Let's throw all our ideas together, let's go to the extremes, let's just test everything, give it all we got. And that was one of the first times that we produced data that showed that we could significantly convert carbon dioxide into something. And that data was great, because then we could take that and go out and raise, pri raise private funding. So we raised a couple of million for our pre-seed round. We had already brought in public funding from the National Science Foundation, from NASA, and so forth. So uh, we were starting to build up these resources to bring it to, to market. And, and that was the first moment where we said, okay, this could work. Mm -hmm. Now, there's still many, there were still many miles to go from that point. Um, we had to scale it up again, you know, those four iterations and do it. But, um, but just realizing that carbon dioxide could, you know, in a, in a reactor that was designed for it and could, you know, be unlocked for this feedback, for this, uh, as a feedstock was really the first time we realized that. Yeah. So the proof of concept kind of evolved out of you being based at university. Could you tell us a bit about your background? Because uh, I, I believe you know, it's engineering, that's your specialty. Mm -hmm. like, how important was that to getting you into this field? Yeah, my background is mechanical engineering. So I was in the mechanical engineering department at Stanford. My advisor was in chemical engineering. And his lab was very interdisciplinary. So they had chemists there, other chemical engineering students there, um, physics students. I mean, it was, it was all across the board. Um, so I do think work these days is deep tech. Like when you're doing something, you're bringing new physics uh, to the market. You can really come at it from different angles. You almost need uh, you know, people who can look at a problem in different ways and um, you know, bring all this together. Because our, our reactors, now, again, that has these electrode stacks, I mean, there's 
mass transport considerations. There's the electrochemical reaction that's happening in there. So that's typically chemistry or chemical engineering. Um, there's stress and strain. So again, like you know, the mechanics of it. Um, there's electronics. So we have electrical engineers that we hire that we bring together. Um, and so for me, you know, like having the, that mechanics lens, the understanding the thermodynamics of it, and understanding kind of electrochemistry, was really fundamental to uh, bringing this reaction together. But then also having a breadth of you know, knowing that other people needed to look at the problem and help us build this product was really essential. Do you have any advice for founders who maybe have seen something that they think is interesting or has potential, you know, perhaps something that someone they know is working on in a different lab or, mm-hmm. or something they've stumbled across online, but they're not themselves a specialist in the field? Do you need to be a subject area expert to be a founder or can you bring in the expertise and... And, and still succeed as a, you know, a generalist or someone who's working from the outside? Yeah, absolutely. I think you can bring in other people. In fact, my co-founder, who's our CEO, he learned about electrochemistry and learned CO2 conversion and transformation, partly from me and my, my third co-founder, Kendra, but also just by taking classes and learning from others and reading on his own. So you, you absolutely can come from a different field and move into it. It, it. it is a learning curve, though, so you do want to take the time to really dive deep into the technology, because even my co-founder as CEO, you know, he does a lot of the fundraising, and investors have questions, and they, you know, to, to be having to say, oh, let me go get someone from the lab to answer this, like, you know, very straightforward scientific question can be challenging. So, you know, you want to have not only just the CEO, but your sales team and everyone who's kind of like externally facing to have some fundamental understanding of the technology. Um, but it absolutely, absolutely can happen. Now, as someone who, you know, did the rare thing, which is, is very atypical to take what you do in grad school and bring it uh, to industry, I can say there is an advantage to that, I, and I, I really loved, I loved the research as I was graduating, and so I had the privilege to be able to carry it forth. But it is atypical, and many people will work in a technology that's adjacent to what they studied, where they still have the basic understanding, but can very quickly pick up the nuances and details of what they eventually bring to market. And how did the piloting go? You mentioned kind of the four iterations, you know, we've We've got the proof of concept. How does the road look from getting from knowing this works in a lab to this can scale, this can actually be a business? Yeah, there were many um, moments there. So when we first started off, we, you know, we naively thought that you know, we, were, we were three graduate students from Stanford at the time. You know, we could raise a bunch of money and we could go out and, you know, just deploy this technology all on our own and we could build everything from the ground up. We had some sobering moments those early days. One, we realized we could not raise directly from venture capital directly, so we had to, you know, bring in public funding. There was a program at, called Activate at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. So we, you know, we were able to bring the funds in a, in a different way than we initially thought. Um, we also realized, too, that building everything from scratch was going to be very challenging. Hardware is, ha- is hard, and deep tech, when you're you know, bringing in new physics or new chemistry, can even be harder. And so we really need to focus on just what our core component, which was that electrode. So we worked with a manufacturing partner um, called Nell. So they build the kind of hardware, the outer casing that holds our electrode, for an adjacent technology. So, you know, we, we talked with them and we said, hey, can we partner with you all? We'll, we'll write grants together, we'll, we'll do this. And so, they, so we did for the first uh, five years or so of our company, we would send our electrodes to this manufacturing partner and they would make stacks. And we made our first um, system, which looks like a dishwasher. Um, and we used that system to make the sunglasses and, comp- and, and the car part with Mercedes-Benz. That was all done with a manufacturing partner. The problem that we realized as we started to grow, so when you work with a manufacturing partner, you are never their top priority. <laughs> no matter how much money you, they charge you or you give them um, to kind of speed up the process, they always have a customer that is going to be their top priority. And so 
we came to the conclusion that, okay, we've built this first system, but if we really are going to build our commercial system that we're going to deploy, and if we're going to move quickly, we need to build our own stack and bring at least a major component of it in-house. Uh, so we did that, and we, we actually um, received some funding in the form of a loan from a philanthropic agency that um, basically took the risk on us. So we were taking a bet that we could build this stack, uh, under budget and, and within a certain amount of time, and and use it as our um, as our commercial product, and so they placed that bet on us, and then we we built the stack, and so now we do our stack manufacturing in house. We still leverage suppliers, and you know they make components of the stack, but we build and assemble the entire stack and designed it in house. Now our SCID, which is the shipping container size system. That we still will leverage contractors and so forth, but we're still controlling the design and we work directly with those contractors um, to be able to build in house. So at each step of the process, you know, we, we did what we felt was appropriate at that time. You know, if we had tried to build our entire stack from that, you know, those first couple of years, we, you know, we probably would have ran out of money. You know, we didn't have the team in place at that time to really build a stack out. But then after five years, after we had, you know, had a full system, we had, products out in the market, we showed that we could do it. Then it was a time to really scale, and we realized, okay, now we need to bring more things in-house. And now, and now we're kind of still asking that question, okay, like how, you know, do we need to even build all of the stack components? Can we outsource some things to a manufacturer that might have a, a bigger, you know, bigger scale or be able to do this more cheaply? So it's always a question we're, we're kind of wrestling with and trying to figure out. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what's next for the company, like in terms of scaling up and kind of large-scale commercialization. You mentioned kind of Alaska Airlines, mm -hmm. you know, sustainable aviation fuel, it's a big sector, uh, e-fuels, plastics, like you're working in a space that is occupied by, you know, the oil industry, which is a huge, huge, huge industry. So it feels like there's a lot of potential to grow, but how do you see that going in kind of the, the, the medium sort of term? Yeah, we're really excited about our partnership with Alaska Airlines and Microsoft. And so, you know, Microsoft is committed to, um, you know, offsetting their entire missions from the start of the company. And so when their employees fly on Alaska Airlines, they basically are offsetting the carbon and like, paying the premium for the sustainable aviation fuel. And with IAG, we have this big 14-year agreement. Um, they've agreed to purchase a billion liters of sustainable aviation fuel for us, which has been huge because that... That is representing multiple plants that we will need to build to service that contract in the next 14 years. And having the contract in place means that we can finance. We can get project financing, we can get project equity, project debt. In fact, we announced a 645 million, mostly project equity and project debt round that we raised. Uh, we announced that a few weeks. And that'll be to build out not only just our first plant, but our first 10 plants. So are we, we are building our first plant in Moses Lake, Washington. Washington State in the, uh, in the US, and it's about a year away from, from startup and from ignition. And for, once we start that up, that will be regular deliveries of our sustainable aviation fuel uh, to our partners. And we're really excited about that. But behind all of this, we still have that unit economics and the cost curve. Because as you mentioned, oil and gas dominates this in industry. And if we're going to truly compete with oil and gas, we need to compete on price. Yeah. And so, you know, we, we constantly see as our North Star, you know, how do we get our unit economics such that we can produce the sustainable aviation field as close as possible to petroleum? And we see a pathway within the next five to eight years where we can, uh, you know, if we can get to scale and we can nail all our milestones, uh, we'll be approximately in that region. And so that'll be really exciting to be able to, you know, sell our fuel and have our fuel be at cost parity with petroleum which does fluctuate itself. Like petroleum has is a spot market, it's a wholesale, so you know, it goes anywhere from two to four dollars per gallon. So that's our target as yeah. well. That's I mean not the only thing that varies. The other big variable it feels like is the price of electricity, mm -hmm. uh, which you know, which runs the process. How do you think about that as like a a future uncertainty and are there ways of future proofing the business against price shocks like we've seen in the last few years? Yeah, so electricity is interesting because when we first got started 10 years ago, you know, hands down, renewable electricity was the cheapest form of electricity out there. 
you can and still, you know, can then and still can get these 20-year power purchase agreements for renewable electricity. The difference today, though, is that those power purchase agreements are becoming more expensive because we are in competition uh, at the moment with kind of data centers, with AI and crypto and so forth. And, you know, we've had to go in and really see that trend and, um, and go in and find the land that may not be attractive to a data center, so maybe there's no fiber laid there, in which case that'd be an attractive spot for us. If, if there's electricity and we, there's a railway, we can bring in CO2 and take out jet fuel. So our project team has been really great at being able to find these one-off sites. But in reality, it is something we'll have to look at for the long term. And I'd love to see a world, and I think there is a world in which the competition can, between us and AI and, and other electrification startups can become an opportunity where, you know, just we build more renewables. Like, let's just get as much renewables on the grid, let's get nuclear, let's get all of this carbon-free electricity and let's electrify everything. And then have so much electricity that we're basically, you know, so, you know, so cheap that you can just use it for, you know, making fuels at night or whatever. We, we can be intermittent, so we don't need to have the, not, you know, 99.99% uptime that a data center might want or other types of, um, like, digital uh, electrification. So we really see that as an opportunity as, as an industry goes that we can work together. But, you know, right now in the short term, we have had to find the, the diamonds in the roughs, like the little the, the sites that uniquely work for us and, and aren't as attractive for a data center. And I want to ask, are there, are there other potential revenue streams here? Because if, you know, as our host mentioned at the beginning, setting aside fuels, things like car parts or, you know, other hard plastics that in theory last a long time, mm -hmm. they embody carbon and they are carbon negative. Like, would you consider selling credits if, you, if you're operating at scale and drawing down enough carbon for that to, to be a large enough amount? And also, who provides you with the carbon? And it seems like you're, you're doing someone a favor there. <laughs> Do, is that a service that can be offered to people as well? Yeah, so we do take carbon dioxide emissions from industrial point sources. Those are ideal locations. Um, in the U.S., at least, there, there, is, um, there is a uh, inherent price for CO2. We've always built in a price for CO2 into our models, and uh, the reason that it exists is in part because of the policy. So there's a... Um, in the Inflation Reduction Act, there is a term called 45Q, and it basically said that if you utilize CO2 or sequester it, you get, you know, 60 to 80 dollars per ton. And so, you know, every point source emission, um, you know, especially coin ethanol or paper and pulp, where you get these high purity uh, CO2, they are aware of this policy, and so there's there's almost like a competition a little bit for CO2 there's uh, CO2 pipelines that'll take the CO2 and sequester it. And so we also there have, it's a marketplace, so we have to go in and we have to, you know, offer a fair price for our CO2 that we want to purchase from them. So we are taking their CO2 away, which improves the CI score oftentimes of their core materials. And then, you know, we, we leverage it for our system. Uh, but again, it's, a, it's another um, point of sales and another like uh, marketplace that we have to, to interact into. And as far as other revenue sources, we, we are always looking for that, and especially now with um, the policy about to change, uh, potentially, in the U.S. with our recent elections. I think we, you know, we, there may be new opportunities that pop up. There may be uh, some that go away. And so we, we're kind of, you know, really trying to diversify. I mean, there's, there's other ways in which our technology can be useful. So, um, we, we had a contract, for example, with the U.S. Air Force, and there the Air Force was interested in being able to make fuels anywhere, which you can. You can take CO2 from the air, you can get w water generally everywhere, um, and there, you know, electricity can be brought in from a nuclear reactor or uh, solar, wind, or so, so forth. And so, um, you know, there's a strategic advantage to reduce the casualties in a fuel convoy to be able to just make fuel on site. And so, you know, we were able to deliver on that contract and, you know, some, you know, maybe we'll go back and talk to the Air Force in this case, or maybe we'll look at other kind of revenue sources to get our technology or maybe new materials that we'll make, new consumer products um, that we can pivot into. But since carbon is a pretty versatile molecule, it does bind with different 
um, hydrogens and oxygens, and you can make different materials. There is a wide breadth of things that we can look at. Cool. Well, I think we're, we're just about at time. I feel like we've yeah. only really scratched <laughs> the surface of, of, of this topic. There's so much more we could talk about. But, Tasha, thank you so much for, for joining me here. Yeah, and, thank you. Um, yeah, for, for providing everyone with this insight. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>